Greetings students and welcome back to another lesson on complex variables. In this video I'm going to talk about integrating complex logarithm functions. Watching the previous video on branch point and branch cuts is essential, links in the description, because that's what I'm going to be applying here. I also recommend solving this problem with me to better consolidate things. Our goal in this lesson is to integrate the natural log of x over 1 plus x squared from 0 to infinity. There's really three basic steps behind performing an integration like this. The first is to write the function being integrated in terms of z. The second is to set up the contour of integration using a branch cut to make the natural log a single valued function as opposed to a multiple valued function. And the third step is to set up the integration and apply the residue theorem. Let's do the first step where we'll let f of z equal ln of z over z squared plus 1, the function being integrated. Now the denominator here can be factored as z plus i times z minus i, which is going to come in handy later. Now this factorization means that if we draw the complex plane, the denominator of f of z gives rise to two poles, one at z equals i up here, and the other at z equals negative i down here. In addition, the natural log itself is undefined at zero, so the origin is also a pole. Now comes the second step, putting in a branch cut that'll make my function single-valued and setting up an appropriate contour of integration. In the last video, I showed you that you could make a branch cut in any direction, but for this problem, there are a few special considerations. One consideration is that we probably don't want a branch cut along the real axis, because ultimately this real portion of our contour integral will get us what we want for our answer. In addition, we don't want our branch cut such that our contour goes through any of our poles. If it does, we can't use the residue theorem. The residue theorem just doesn't work if the contour has poles on it. Only when the poles are inside the contour does the residue theorem apply. So keeping all this in mind, here's what I'll do. I'll make a branch cut along the negative imaginary axis and keep the argument of my complex number z between negative pi by 2 and 3 pi by 2. I also need to avoid the origin. So here's the contour that I'm going to make. I'll make a large semicircular curve of radius capital R with center O that's going around. Then I'll make a small semicircular contour of radius rho with center capital O that's going around. Then I'll connect them like this and end up with this composite contour which I'll call C. The contour integral over this closed curve C is then the sum of the integrals over these semicircular arcs, which I'll call C sub R and C sub rho. The C sub rho integral is clockwise, plus the integrals over the real axis from negative R to negative rho and from rho to capital R. If we want to find our integral in question, we should be focusing on this particular integral. And we should also take the limits as rho approaches zero and capital R approaches infinity. When we do that, this is the integral equation we end up with for the integral that we care about. I'll call this equation one. Now, according to the residue theorem, we can write this closed contour integral over C as two pi i times the sum of the residues of the poles of f of z contained within the contour C. But the only pole that's actually contained in C is the pole at z equals i, so we just have to find the residue of f of z at z equals i. Let me do that on the side here. z equals i is a simple pole, since z minus i only occurs once in the denominator of f of z, so all we have to do is multiply f of z by z minus i and substitute z equals i into the remaining expression. When we multiply f by z minus i, we're only left with z plus i in the denominator. And when we substitute z equals i, we'll get ln of i over 2i. But we don't know what ln i is, or do we? Recall from the previous video that the natural log of a complex number is the natural log of its modulus plus i times the argument of that complex number plus 2 pi n, where n is some integer. So in our case, the natural log of i is just the natural log of the modulus of i, the modulus of i is 1, so its natural log of 1 is just 0, plus i times the argument of i plus 2 pi n. The argument of i is pi by 2, and I can also ignore the 2 pi n. Do you know why I've done that? If we go way back up, you'll see that the branch I created to make my natural log single valued takes in z's with an argument between negative pi by 2 and 3 pi by 2. So for z equals i, the only option for the argument that I have 
which is also contained within this interval, is pi by 2. That's why I picked it, and that's why I crossed off the 2 pi n. I have a single-valued branch. I'm not dealing with a multiple-valued function anymore. Anyway, once I substitute this ln i into my expression for the residue, I end up with a residue of pi by 4 at z equals i for the function f of z. Plugging this into equation 1 gets me the following expression for my integral. Now, I can make further simplifications to all of this if I move this last integral from negative r to negative rho to the left-hand side, and if I write out the function f of z in all of my integrals. Now, in this first integral on the left, I'm just integrating over the positive real numbers, so I can take out the z and replace it by a simple real number x. For the second integral, I can use the definition of the complex logarithm to write out the numerator as follows, as the ln of the modulus of z plus i times the argument of z. Again, I'm not including the 2 pi n here because this logarithm has been modified to be single valued. We're only using a single branch. For this integral, we're also integrating over the reals. So again, I can replace z by x. However, the argument of z is now pi because we're working over the negative real axis. Again, it's pi because we've restricted our arguments to lie between negative pi by 2 and 3 pi by 2 to create our branch. The only argument of z which falls within this interval that corresponds to the negative real axis is then pi. Now what we do is split up the terms in the numerator and split up the resulting integrals to obtain the following. The denominator of the second integral is an even function, so it's the same no matter whether we're integrating from 0 to infinity or negative infinity to 0. It's symmetric uh, on a reflection over the uh, imaginary axis or the y-axis. In addition, this natural log of the absolute value of x becomes simply the natural log of x if I change the limits on my second integral to become 0 to infinity. So for the second integral, I can simply change it to going from 0 to infinity because the integrals from infin negative infinity to 0 is the same. When I do that, I can combine it with the first integral to get the following. 2 times that integral from 0 to infinity of ln x over x squared plus 1. Now this integral of 1 over x squared plus 1 is just the inverse tangent, if you recall your identities from uh, calculus 2. When I evaluate the inverse tangent from the limit of x going to infinity and subtract the inverse tangent of 0, I get pi by 2 minus 0, which is just pi by 2. So now if I isolate my integral of interest, I end up with the following equation because the two constants cancel out. All that's left now is to evaluate these two integrals on the right. But I won't really evaluate them. I'll show that both of them are zero using the ML inequality theorem or the estimation lemma that I covered in a previous video. Links in the description. I'll start with this first integral, the integral over C sub capital R. Because the function being integrated is analytic over the C sub R, I can use the ML inequality to say that the magnitude of this integral is less than or equal to the maximum value on the contour of the function being integrated, the capital M, times the length of the contour L. And I'll call this inequality equation 2. The length of the contour L is just pi r, because it's a semicircular contour. 2 pi r is the circumference of the full circle, therefore pi r is the circumference of the semicircle. But what about the maximum value M? That's the real question. Well, the modulus of the whole integral is just the integral of the modulus, which I can then split up into separate moduli of the numerator and denominator. So how do I find the maximum possible value of the function that's being integrated here? Well, I can find the maximum possible value of the numerator and the minimum possible value of the denominator. If I expand out the numerator using the definition of natural log, here's what I'll get. Now, the magnitude of the sums of the ln of the modulus of z plus i times the argument of z, this magnitude is less than the sum of the individual magnitudes per the triangle inequality of complex numbers. Now, on the contour c sub r, the modulus of z is just r. In addition, the maximum possible value of r z on this contour is pi, which is the left end of the cr contour. The i goes away because its magnitude is just 1. Therefore, the maximum possible value of the numerator is just ln r plus pi. 
For the denominator, the minimum possible value is found by using expressions which the denominator must be greater than or equal to. Using this logic, the magnitude of z squared plus 1 must be greater than or equal to the magnitude of z squared minus 1. This should make intuitive sense. Therefore, since we're on the semicircular contour CR, the minimum possible value of the denominator is r squared minus 1. And as a result, we can write our m for this integral, our maximum possible value, as the following. And if we substitute this into the ML inequality in equation 2, we get the following equation. If I now take the limit of this as capital R approaches infinity, I can show that the limit of this expression on the right-hand side approaches zero using L'Hopital's rule as R approaches infinity. As an exercise, I invite you to apply L'Hopital's rule to determine this limit to verify this. I won't do that here because that's not the primary goal of this lesson. Anyway, since the magnitude is zero, we can conclude that the integral itself is zero as capital R approaches infinity. Let's now determine the integral over the smaller semicircular arc C rho. Using the ML inequality, the magnitude of this integral again must be less than the maximum value on C rho of the function being integrated times the length of C rho. By the same logic of the previous calculation, we can calculate the maximum possible value of the function on C rho to be the following. The only difference here is that in the denominator I have 1 minus rho squared because rho is approaching 0, so rho is a small number. So rho must be less than 1. We can't have rho squared minus 1 because that's negative. And you can verify this identity that the magnitude of rho squared plus 1 must be greater than or equal to 1 minus uh, the magnitude of rho squared. Anyway, the length of the contour here is pi times rho. And if I take the limit as rho approaches 0, I can once again show that the answer is zero. For the rho times ln zero term, I can just use L'Hopital's rule to prove this, and I invite you to verify that this is indeed the case. We can therefore conclude that the integral over C rho is zero as rho approaches zero. Finally, when we plug all this back into the equation for the integral we ultimately want, we find that since both of our integrals on the right are zero as we take the limits, the integral from 0 to infinity of ln x over x squared plus 1 is 0. All that work for nothing. But the result doesn't matter, it's the journey that really counts. And in this journey, we learn how to integrate complex logs using branch cuts. Anyway, that should do it for this video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher. And if you enjoyed this lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.